game aimed squarely at me because it is uh, narrative and strategy and turn-based tile strategy all in one. So as I begin, uh, we're watching some pre-recorded footage here. Feel free to uh, ask questions for John and Tom while we're talking. We're here to talk about making Pendragon, so please be sure to um, square your questions that way. And uh, yeah, we're just going to have a conversation about making these games, but I should let them introduce themselves. John, Tom, how are you doing? We're good. I mean, launch day is always a bit crazy. Um, I'm suffering a little bit from having pressed the refresh button on Twitter just a few thousand too many times mm -hmm. today. Uh, otherwise, I'm good. It's been really nice, actually, as we've launched a lot of games. Inkle's been going about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time that we've launched a game that we actually had finished, like, <laughs> two weeks ago. Like, <laughs> normally, <laughs> you kind of sprint to the final line. But this one, we because we knew the game is so complicated and so, like, weirdly put together that we really were very scared about getting it solid and tested so we started testing ages ago mm -hmm. and then we finished testing and then for the last few weeks we've been going should we add this nah let's not add that <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's been quite relaxed actually for some in some ways but launch day is always launch day it's always nerve-wracking so we're, we're, we're okay we're okay yeah and uh john we've had you on the stream before tom you're new to the stream would you mind introducing yourself Hi, yeah, I'm Tom. I am uh, John. What's my job title? Um, uh, senior, your senior developer. Senior designer developer. Now, I, it's all the words. <laughs> <laughs> ah, <right. laughs> I make things with John uh, Inkle, <laughs> um, and yeah, everything John was saying. Like we took today off, in fact, because um, apparently we're that confident or stupid. <laughs> um, but nothing seems to have gone wrong, which is really nice. And yeah, such um, a change of pace to normally how games get released. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, everyone who has saw, caught me looking down at my phone. I had to tweet out that we're live. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's it's live. It's live television. This is where we make our mistakes uh, for you to see. Uh, <laughs> quick shout out to Favlet in chat. Thank you for joining us today, Favlet. We'd love to have you. Uh, John and Tom, let's get to it. Uh, Pendragon, like I said, narrative game, turn-based strategy. Uh, um, uh, and it's cool. It's neat. You're seeing me discover how cool and neat it is right now, where I'm like navigating a conversation by doing turn-based strategy things. Can you tell me how this game started and what were sort of Inkle's design goals uh, after after the uh, interesting game that was interesting and ambitious, Heaven's Vault? Yeah. So it, the chronology doesn't quite work like that. The game Pendragon was already quite heavily designed by the time we released Heaven's Vault. So, mm -hmm. the, but the two are kind of connected. Basically, while we were working on Heaven's Vault, which is like a big 3D game, lots of cameras, lots of like fucking around with 3D and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, when we wanted to not be working on Heaven's Vault, when we needed a break, uh, especially Tom, Tom was building a turn-based strategy prototype board game mostly just because it was the most unlike Heaven's Vault thing he could possibly do with his spare time while still making a game. That's about right, isn't it, Tom? That's about right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we were messing around with it that and kind of over lunch breaks and like when we went to the pub in the evenings and we'd just sort of try out the rules of this game and sort of and play it. And after about maybe two years of fiddling around with that prototype, we ended up with a really good, really strong two-player game that was a little, little bit like chess or a little bit like checkers mm -hmm. and it was played with counters on a five by five board and you could have made it out of wood and sold it in a shop mm -hmm. and we kind of thought well we can't do anything with that because we make narrative games and you can't possibly stick a narrative on on a game like that can you but then once you have a feeling like that once you have a question like well you can't possibly do that can you you start to think well or can you <laughs> that's kind of how Pendragon happened, I think, was like after the end of Heaven's Vault, we had this sense that we didn't really know what to do next. We didn't want to make Heaven's Vault 2. We had this prototype knocking around. So I think we kind of thought, well, let's just see how far we can take this idea of putting a narrative onto an abstract strategy board game and making it work. Because mm -hmm. it, it won't work. It's going to fall apart. It's going to go wrong. This is a ridiculous idea. It can't be done. And then we carried on doing it and like, yeah, and now we've released it, and it appears to work. So <laughs> we got to the other end of it. But. Uh, Tom, do you want to tell tell any of your experience aside, from, you know, fiddling? It's it's cool to see a game that you fiddle with in your spare time become, you know, a full game. Yeah, I mean, it's honestly the dream. At least it's certainly my dream um, to have like a boss be like, "Oh, let's make that game you've been playing with." Um, but yeah, it goes back a really long way. It actually, goes back 
So when I first joined the company and we were porting 80 days to Steam, mm -hmm. and that's when, at least according to my notes that um, I've been keeping, it goes back to 2015. Mm -hmm. And I remember showing it to uh, Joe, because I think, John, you were off having your second kid. So Joe actually played it a lot more at the time. And then when Joe went off to have his kid, that's when you started playing it with me. And that's when you started throwing these dangerous ideas and adding a story to it. And I started getting all scared. Um, and you proposed that you would add the AI to the game because I couldn't play it um, against myself. So I had to test it over lunch. You said, I'll write the AI. And then I might also add a story or something. I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds yeah, like a good yeah. idea. I made, I, made <laughs> a, I made a Faustian pact with you, which was I agreed to write you an AI on the condition that I could also write a narrative layer for it. And you were like, yeah, sure. That sounds like a fair trade. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly, over the next two years, the narrative layer took your beautiful, balanced, symmetric game and ripped it to pieces. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. Uh, we're actually, the game is demonstrating something interesting, which is, so unlike, this, the strategy game has a little bit of chess in it, which is uh, your units can only move certain directions depending on uh, uh, certain tiles, and capturing is just a matter of, like, this isn't, like, XCOM, this isn't Fire Emblem, there's no fancy stats, it's just move, capture. So it's ch it's very chess-like to me. Um, while units mostly move diagonally, they cannot capture other pieces, while they must be adjacent to them. So it creates this interesting back and forth that gets more complex later on. Tom, I suppose since this is your baby, like, what made you go, Oh, yeah, chess! That's a game that is already solved, I'm gonna make strategy chess with... And then it's <laughs> Arthurian. Um, so... It's sort of a bugbear of mine. Like, I really, really like tactics games. And, like, mm -hmm. I started playing Fire Emblem and Advance Wars on Game Boy when I was a kid. And I sort of always really loved those kind of games. But I'm not uh, a PC gamer. And so mm -hmm. I sort of missed out on, um, like, XCOM and that kind of thing. And whenever I tried learning them, I, I just couldn't. Because there's too many buttons and rules and menus and stuff. And so this was kind of me trying to take what I really loved about tactics games and boil it down into something without any context menus, without um, like resources or numbers. I want to just basically make it really minimal, which you know also means you can make it on your own um, fairly easily. I thought it'd be a really fun design challenge. And it actually turns out that that's really hard because it tends <laughs> to be all of the menus and stuff that you know gives these games the complexity they need to be interesting for like 20 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously chess, solved this <laughs> you can play a lot of chess and so i ended up sort of going down the same route just because that seems to be the route um, if you want to make a tactics game that is very replayable i won't go infinite um you kind of have to find ways to give all of your actions um as much nuance to them as possible like mm -hmm. this action isn't just something minor it actually changes the state in this sort of fairly important way mm -hmm. so you have you can really puzzle over each move right on yeah, and yeah so I'm, oh john go for it go for it john i was just gonna say i remember one of your goals um was that that idea that you wanted people on every move to be stopping and thinking oh this is an interesting situation and i really want to treat it as a puzzle and like i think we tried a lot of iterations of rules over the years but i remember that was always the metric that was like the pillar of the strategy game was am i puzzling Am I, am I getting an interesting decision to puzzle over during this game, or am I just working through a pattern? So I, I had a really interesting interview with another reviewer last week who was a turn out was quite a chess buff, and he was saying that he felt the game wasn't like chess because when you play chess at a high level, you just execute patterns like you do. Oh, this is the Sicilian defense, and this is the whatever gambit, and chess players look at these patterns and just apply the patterns to each other. And he was saying one of the things he liked about Pendragon was there weren't any patterns. Like you genuinely had to actually think about what you were doing on every move. And I said, well, there probably are patterns, you just haven't found out what they are yet. Yeah. But, and, but you know, it was kind of a nice thing actually to, to try and make something that had the responsiveness of not chess played at a high level, but chess played at like a sort of low level where you do interesting moves, but you don't actually know how to play chess properly. And I thought that was quite a nice <laughs> thing to end up with. It's like chess, but fun. <laughs> That's actually, uh, we have, man, we aren't even talking about like the interesting procedural story things that happen here, and we're and we're off to some great design questions. Uh, I agree with it. I have just such an inverse reaction to that, to that reviewers talk about chess, which is that um, 
I think of chess and I think of it more like, you know, the strategy games I enjoy, which is I am looking at, uh, but that's because I am a bad chess player. Um, mm. I play other strategy games where I'm like a much better player. And even then I'm still more like reactive, like, okay, I'm here. I have these abilities. Like, like that's where I thrive as a player. Um, so what did you sort of learn about like, I don't know, like, you know, taking sort of the, the core part of chess, which is moving pieces around throwing out the pattern the pattern part that you know identifiable patterns and like help making it so that players could make these decisions you can see me negotiating decisions around these bears as we speak um so i'm kind of curious like what your thoughts were for making sure that like you know uh it was never a solved problem i guess you were never you were you were you were, how did you avoid making a solved game he said knowing many developers would happily make solved games <laughs> i think I think when we when we were originally building the abstract board game, like it was a five by five grid and the team started in either corner. And we played that game a lot and we enjoyed it and it was interesting. But I, I think it probably was a solved game or a solvable game. I think Tom, you were much, much better at it than I ever got to be. But I think you had a sense that, that game that game was finite. You could get to a point where you could just master it and then it wouldn't be interesting anymore. Yeah, right. And as soon as that happened, I'd say, right, uh, it doesn't work. We need to change a rule because I've solved it. And then you'd go, no, 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 you you haven't solved it. Look, I'll beat you. And then you'd lose. And then say, no, no, we've solved it. <laughs> and this happened a lot, like maybe like 30, 40 times or something like that. And I remember yeah. there was this one time when um, I was like, oh, John, I've got this strategy and I'm pretty sure I can just completely ruin the game. And at the time, you could um, infinitely create new knights. There wasn't yeah. a limit on it. Um, there wasn't a variable that said, you know, it costs this many to spawn. And so I said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spawn a knight, I'm going to move him. And then I'm going to spawn another guy, I'm going to move him. I just built this wall. And it completely broke the game. And like, none of us have really thought to play like that because it sounds really boring and it's fun to move your pieces across. And, you know, that's kind of a prime example of how we added a rule to the game. We played it, broke it, and then said, right, this doesn't work. Let's, in this case, I think we went straight for adding um, a variable, like a, like Amaral, which yeah, really helped so. actually straight away. Um, I think we called it Spawn Monkey for the longest time, and I don't know why. Let, but let's we be did. clear, you called it Spawn Monkey. <laughs> 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 I, as a writer, wouldn't dream of calling it Spawn Monkey. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Um, well, while I could let you two uh, um, insult each other and slag, and slag each other <laughs> and, and chat all I want, let's talk about um, there's a procedural narrative component here. So as you can see, uh, if you're watching the gameplay footage, um, Guinevere, my chosen character, has, has an ability called Push Forwards, uh, which he picked up when I made a decision back there in the meta, in the meta layer uh, out in the game world. Um, or maybe I got it earlier because I still love Arthur. Arthur, and this is this is an ability that I could see normally manifesting a, a character having through you know a, a leveling tree, a talent tree. Um, it's just simple as like she can move further. She spends energy to move further. Sure, simple. But these abilities pop up in Pendragon. This is what makes it unique um, because of narrative choices you make. And narrative choices aren't just dialogue trees. They're how you get through missions. How do you do you murder these spiders? Like lots of interesting things will happen in this hour because not just how I made decisions narratively, but how I made decisions strategically, which I think is really cool. So would you two mind talking about that layer of gameplay and how like abilities came out of story and that sort of thing? It's interesting to think about how we designed that. Like, I think there was, a, so we were talking about how the five by five game felt quite solved. And we mm -hmm. started to solve that by, partly by adding rules, but also by adding variation to the board, right? Mm -hmm. And changing the shape of the board. And we found that adding just one of those hummock squares where you can go in any direction completely shifted the balance of the strategies yeah. and the patterns. So that was really useful. But then another idea we kind of naturally had was, well, you know, what if we have pieces with, with extra abilities? We have heroes and they have some kind of special ability. And like, can we find some special abilities that don't just destroy the game straight away, but are fun to use? And eventually that got tied into the resolve mechanic. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really have a sense of how to how to pace those out. Like, when should we unlock it? We didn't want to do experience points. We didn't want to do like another resource that you collect. We thought about like, you know, you gain 10 for clearing a level and you gain five for killing an enemy. And, and when you get 30, you get one. But it, it just felt really arbitrary. It just felt really like random. Like it wouldn't be very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And then I think the particular solution we hit on actually came, I was rewatching the Lord of the Rings films and uh, there's the bit where the, I've forgotten her name, but the lady in armor, like the, the, the king of the undead guy says, you know, no man can kill me. And she rips off her helmet and says, I am no man. And then plunges a sword into him and, and kills him. 
Yes. And I thought, oh, I love that thing of heroic figures having like a call to arms or having a kind of motto or having or doing a big speech on the battlefield where they say, for God and King Henry. And then uh -huh. everyone suddenly is buffed up and can do stuff. And that idea really resonated for me because it, it kind of connected the the mythological tone, but also the strategy board game. So at that point, all oh, right, okay, basically they should do a special move when they're able to shout a rallying cry. Yeah. And that brought me to think, well, okay, what what gives you a rallying cry? And like, well, it's it's you declaring your love for someone. It's you're losing, you've you've lost your lover on the battlefield, and that that just felt so felt so rewarding and so good that we had to explore it and like yeah it's quite it's quite weird in a way because it means that you have you don't really know what's going to happen in terms of what moves you'll get or what moves um or how the moves will change over time but the one thing i really like is when you when you've got a move that's really good and you're really enjoying using it and it's connected to something like you know i found my love and then your love gets murdered by a spider on the battlefield and you lose that move and it changes to you know i will avenge my fallen Love, and you get something else because you lost something because mm -hmm. the character did lose something that's just lovely like that kind of where the, the change in the narrative causes the gameplay to change in a way that you might not actually like that isn't technically an upgrade mm -hmm. but it's right and that felt to me really strong and really interesting and I'm, I'm kind of every time the system can do that can make something happen which is not great but feels appropriate yeah then i think that, yeah no we found something interesting there but before our nerd cred gets slammed too hard it is aowen who shouts that and i also double checked that if you saw me go for my phone because i really wanted to make sure i didn't have aowen and arwen mixed up uh because <laughs> uh i am a nerd and nerds are pedantic um uh but yeah i love that example john um tom did you have any thoughts about like from a game from a design perspective how how these these narrative abilities manifest and how they make your game better your perfect chess yeah so um john was always like oh i want to add this this thing and i <laughs> like from the story side it's going to change the gameplay and every time he said that i'd be like oh no he's going to break the game and i i kept throwing down these rules like okay like yeah fine they can get abilities but you know the, we have to test all the abilities really carefully because they don't break anything and like they all need to be perfectly balanced with each other and actually in the end like a lot of that turned out not to be true um like for the reasons john was saying like it's it's so long as they are narratively appropriate, it's actually really interesting when you get a move that is actually, you know, quite overpowered or maybe it's underpowered because the thing that caused it is, yeah. you know, embarrassing or sad or just, just sort of fits the tone. Um, and there's also sort of moves that feel like they've been meaningfully upgraded or downgraded. And you just don't get that sense if everything is sort of perfectly balanced, um, which was kind of always my instinct for this game is to keep everything very pure and elegant. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that that's this really nice tension in the game um, with sort of, yeah, the way that the gameplay and the story interact, it doesn't ever fight, but it creates, yeah, this tension all of the time. My, uh, my, my, my writing loving brain really wants to dive into more of the, uh, like, like writing Arthurian legend, blah, blah, blah. But I also want to linger here in game design world for a minute longer. Um, you know, we've sort of talked about abilities. We've talked about movement and traversal and, and adding things to the game. Um, but how do you like how in a game where like the, the game has to generate scenarios for the player, like this one's really interesting. The one we're in right now, because this isn't a clear friend or foe situation with where we're going. Um, although these rats apparently move diagonally and attack diagonally, um, which is just video games. Um, uh, what What is the secret sauce to making interesting encounters so that the computer can go, oh, I'm going to grab this and this will be the right time for the player to encounter this thing, even though I am a dumb computer and I will only do what I am told to do and I have no agency for now. Yeah, that was really hard, actually. So, um, internally, there's... I, I, I totted them up on Twitter just the night before release, and I think there's something like 20 different heuristic or analytic or algorithmic or AI systems in the game that, mm -hmm. that determine and control what, what the game is doing or what, what the game is going to give to the player, like in terms of the board layout or where the resources are spread. And one of those systems is the one that decides what what scene you're going to encounter. So very broadly, the game has template scenes that you can get into. So this one that you're playing at the moment is the, the meeting the archer in the woods scene. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite a specific one because it's always the archer. But they might be quite generic ones as well, like 
you know, go to a village that's got a problem with some animals, and like the animals can change and the villagers can change, whatever. And that system looks at what you've done and looks at what you're about to do and looks at where you are through the game and looks at it looks at a whole bunch of stuff and it doesn't generate a level I shouldn't really reveal this because I feel like it's secret source but like um, it doesn't decide what scene you're going to get until the absolute last possible moment and then it's all just balanced to try and make sure that the adventure is interesting mm -hmm. like that's its goal there are lots of systems in the game which are fair or which are kind of you know based on difficulty sliders but this particular one is purely for narrative interest and i remember mm -hmm. just about a day before we shipped the demo which was like one it was five levels long it was a run through a five, le five levels long and it did the tutorial and then it did another level and then at the end of it, it tended to give you a hero, a new hero in a castle. You'd get to the castle and you'd meet them. And it was this really limp ending to a demo because it felt like, oh, everything's going fine here. So I wrote a version of the scene where you go to the castle and the hero's supposed to be there, but they're not. And there's a Mordred knight there instead who says, oh, yes, yeah, Sakai was here and I killed him. Mm -hmm. And that was such a good ending for the demo because it was like, dun, dun, dun. Um, and that kind of totally like non-design focused pacing but much more narrative pacing of just sort of playing it and feeling like well have we had enough tension recently have we had enough drama recently well okay what what lever can we poke or what variable can we tweak to try and make it a bit more inclined to give you something exciting now because you're sort of at the right kind of time for that um and that took ages to get right but it was kind of just another kind of balancing really in the mm -hmm. same way that we balance the ai we balance the board generators like it was just another system that wanted to like stick its elbow in and muck around with the game experience tom, but i felt we I felt wanna, we got that right tom do you want to throw in anything at all yeah it's really complicated it's like <laughs> this one <laughs> i mean like i'm allegedly the programmer on the game but i'm fairly certain that the ink script which is sort of john's side of things which is supposed to be for the story but actually has ended up being just this massive amount of logic controlling everything like so much ai has ended up being piled onto the ink um and while a lot of gameplay stuff is kind of like okay we're going to build a feature and then it's in and then that's just a box and then you can stack the boxes on top of each other this thing was just constantly improving for like the whole year and a half of development Gotcha. Um, uh, let's talk about failure. Uh, we're not failure will come much later in the stream because thankfully, I'm sort of savvy. Um, this is a game where failure. Actually, no, we're getting some mild failure. I think in a few minutes. Um, sorry, pre-recorded footage. I hate sounding like a prophet. Um, but uh, um, failure is a weird thing in games because it's it's failure in a shooter means oh okay I can try again and I can do a twitch skill a little bit better in a procedural game failure might go oh well come on like you gave me this when my health was low like come on why didn't the RNG go like twitch this way but because you have a game where we talked about failure sometimes means interesting things change in the narrative and the abilities like this is a this is a specific. Like, it feels like you need a specific vision for how players fail in order to make this game fun. Is that accurate? And if I'm wrong, tell me why. No, that's absolutely accurate. And it's something that we thought about a lot. And actually has been a kind of common recurring theme throughout all the stuff that we've done at Inkle, that we're always interested in creating a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end. And the problem with failure, and it is a drastically serious problem from a narrative point of view, is that the minute that the player fails and tries again, the narrative dies completely yeah. until the player has got to and surpassed whatever point it was where they were getting stuck. And there is only one solution to that in current games, which is the time loop solution, where you go, oh, well, we just do the whole level again, and that's that part of the narrative. And it's fine, but not every game can be a time loop game. Yeah. So what I, what we've tried to do, and we tried to do it in, we sort of dabbled with it in Sorcery, but we definitely do it in 80 Days, and we do it in Heaven's Vault 2, is this idea of failing forwards. Mm -hmm. So in Heaven's like right Vault, now, you can I'm, miss. I'm running away right now. This is failure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So like in Heaven's Vault, you can completely miss huge amounts of like the the content and the the clues that you might that might be in a particular location and the narrative will work to cope to make sure that that just becomes the way that your story went rather than where well, you need to backtrack and pick up that key that was in that chest like in most adventure games um in, in 80 days of course there, there's no way to die really and there's no if you go over 80 days it's not a problem 
So for this game, we knew we wanted the idea that you could fail, but that it would push you forwards and it would push your narrative forwards. But then you have that question of, well, how do you do that if when you get killed, you get killed? Um, which obviously led to us bringing in the flea button, which was pretty controversial and, uh, you know, within the team. And I know Tom was convinced for a long time that no one would ever press the flea button because it was like having a button that literally said i am a loser when you press it um <laughs> hey, he may, he may not but, be wrong it still may be true <laughs> well it may be but like it even well, the weird thing is even when it's strategically absolutely the correct thing to do like mm -hmm. you know you're massively overwhelmed you don't have the support structure to do it you could throw all your knights at this problem and kill them all or you could flee and save your entire party that's a reasonable thing to do strategically but in game world it feels completely unpalatable and i thought that was a really interesting friction actually to kind of bring the player up against this idea that they feel that they're supposed to win every encounter but the game is a tragedy about being overwhelmed by forces much stronger than you like you ought to flee like you ought to flee because everything's going wrong you ought to flee because you found a level that's too hard you ought to read the board and decide you can't win this one and go and do another one and those were all interesting and they come with other narrative consequences attached to them yeah, this um, is about to get very interesting in gameplay for what you're talking about with where Guinevere winds up because this is a can't flee level because I've already fled. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So some of the levels. So that kind of went backwards and forwards what the balance of that was. But yeah, there are some levels where you can't flee to create pinch points where you can die early because in the end we decided it was nice. It was nice to have that as as an option. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the other kind of. Uh, way of avoiding failure, which is the rage mechanic, which I, I don't know if that's going to happen in your oh, stream it's gonna or not. Oh, it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And that, again, was just, it was it was kind of thinking about, well, what's fun? Like, because we do want the game to be fun as well. And so if you're overwhelmed and you get trapped in a corner and then your character just flips out and completely loses their rag and turns into an unstoppable Terminator with, you know, a cost associated with that. like that felt really interesting and it felt really enjoyable to play and it was just a lovely narrative moment. Everybody remembers the first time their character goes into rage mode. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just, it was really interesting to me that this idea of saying we are not going to let you simply die opened up an enormous number of design questions and design ideas and design and narrative opportunities that we simply wouldn't have even thought about if we just said, yeah, when you die, you die and then you restart. You know, or you can restart any level at any time, which was a button we had. Well, we, I mean, we still have it in the debug build of the game, but like that was going to be a button the player could press, you know, just go again. Um, and now it's rage time, so uh, here we'll get to show off that mechanic right now. Um, right, so you, you can lose a rage if you don't manage to murder everyone in within the kind of time limit. She's got like an energy bar which goes down. Um, but you also are very, very overpowered when you're in rage mode. And so it hey, really is just about. That applies for uh, real life too. Hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tom, do you want to throw in on failure, uh, making failure interesting before I move on to my next question? Uh, yeah, I guess it's, I mean, I think John sort of said it all, but I feel like it's almost an inkle philosophy at this point. Every time I pitch a new game design at John, he says, yeah, okay, what happens if you die? And I never have a good answer. <laughs> and something John says a lot, and I think it's definitely true in this, is um, it's about surprising the player. So when they think they've lost, you can give them an extra life that they didn't know they had. And that's sort of what Rage Mode is here. It's like, oh, you really thought you'd lost, but now we're going to give you one more chance. And you obviously can't keep giving that for player. They can't keep failing forward all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. But it's a sort of get out of jail free card you didn't know you had. And I feel that's a lesson that's um, applicable to a lot of games, actually. You can kind of hide a little extra continue in there. Mm -hmm. I like I like in that. In fact, uh, for the longest time, we had um, heroes could have zero health and they'd still be alive. And this is kind of that philosophy extended. And uh, we took that one out in the end because it was sort of too against game convention where, you know, if you have one heart and you lose it, you expect to die. What we had before that was if you have one heart and you lose it, well, now you have no hearts. You're not dead. You just have no hearts. And then it would take another hit to die. Um, and John really, really liked this. Um, and I kept pushing back. And in the end, I think it was just because players kept reporting it as a bug that we took it out. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it would have fit the philosophy. And it would have, I think if players had understood it, it would have felt good for the same reason that Rage Mode felt good, which is just that they thought they'd lost. And then they kind of get this, this moment of hope. 
Yeah, I sadly I think we've been too conditioned by red bars and video games in general. Um, <laughs> we are a stupid lot. Um, okay, uh, now I finally get to be the, the, the story nerd that I love being. Uh, this is an Arthurian game. Um, Arthurian legend and Arthurian lore is interesting uh, because by e even the game kind of reflects this. It's a little bit whatever you want it to be. Do you want the happy story? Well, it's about Arthur finding the stone and, or finding the pulling the sword out of the... No, wait. Lady in the Lake. Right. Arthur is Lady in the Lake. Um, uh, if, if, you, if you want that, you get... That's how you get Excalibur. That's the oh. hero story. If you want the comedy version, you get Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, if you want the tragic version, you have the various uh, Merlin miniseries which have made their way to TV. Like, the whole story of Arthur... Um, and I'm speaking as an American, so I'm literally like, this is the most outside perspective, well, not the most outside perspective, but it's a very <laughs> outside perspective on, on, a, on something that seems very, like, like everyone has opinions about this, you know, and, and instead of telling sort of one linear story about Arthurian legend, you've told a lot of different stories at once that, like, you know, and I'm curious how, once that, where that came into the game and how that influenced the narrative and design direction. Yeah, so, I mean, I've always... I've always been an Arthurian nerd. I loved Arthurian legends as a kid. My favorite book is an Arthurian retelling. Um, so I kind of had that context. And I think when we were first trying to thinking about narrative frameworks, the idea of making it knights in armor battling out just sort of fitted the, the flow of the game. A few people have described it as being a bit like a dance. You kind of dance around the board and strike when you can. And it feels a bit like uh, sword play. It feels a bit like that kind of a swashbuckling feel, especially when they're trading insults while they're moving around. So that, mm -hmm. that tone of being knights with big swords thwacking each other really heavily and really hard felt, felt right um, for, the, for the game, the pace of the game that we'd built. In terms of the, the narrative more widely, though, I think it was quite a struggle for a while to work out how to make it work. Because, I mean, as you say, the Arthurian legend is, is a lot of different stuff and it covers an enormous amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew that we wanted something you know, very focused on combat because that's the core mechanic, very focused on traversing across the, the space, across Britain. Yeah. Um, so you know, it could have been the quest for the Holy Grail, but I mean, that just feels quite nerdy in a way and, and not actually that compelling. Um, and I think, it, I, I don't know when it was that we had this idea of setting it like after the end of the Arthurian myth. And that felt tonally right to me. The, you know, the, the goal of the game is not even to save Arthur or to build Camelot. It's just to literally witness him die. Mm -hmm. um, and that felt like I had the, it had the right sense of, well, you're going to die. Everyone is going to die. The question is only where do you die and how do you die and how well do you die? And that had all that kind of chivalric sort of honor against the darkness, like hope when hope is unreasonable which which i think speaks to me as a, as a tonal thing mm -hmm. um, but it also makes the gameplay feel kind of tense and taut and fraught oh. with danger and it, it ties into that mechanic that we have that which i don't think we've mentioned which is just that anyone on the board can be killed at any time mm -hmm. and the narrative will deal with that mm -hmm. um you know nobody is ever safe at all and if you want to murder all your key people then you can and you will sometimes but whether you want to or not um but it also tied very strongly into into uh, the political angle as well. That I think when we were when we were when we were getting inspired about this game, I realised that one of the reasons that I wanted to do Arthur was the what was happening in British politics at the time, which is still happening and is very much comparable, I think, to what's happening in American politics as well, mm -hmm. where you have a new class of leaders who are so committed to lying to us and to and to hurting the population that they're supposed to be protecting they are so happy to do that and they do it on a daily basis you know in america the the covid situation is unbearable the police brutality situation is unbearable britain is not quite that bad but we are not doing very well either and that sense of um of a leadership that has abdicated its moral responsibility to its people is at the core of the end of the arthurian narrative as mm -hmm. well arthur is this noble just king who is um, thrown off the throne by his son, who's just rubbish, who's just this power-hungry brat, um, who doesn't want anything apart from just to hurt his dad and to screw stuff up. Um, and Arthur goes to face him, even though he knows he can't win against this. He can't, he doesn't stand a chance, but he has to. And that's always spoke to me as a kind of, 
you know, the, as an honourable and noble sacrifice in that kind of romantic vision. Um, the book that I liked as a kid, which is called The Once and Future King, was written um, very much about the rise of Nazism in the 30s, but as a King Arthur story. But that it's that same tone, and that same tone applies now, and that sense of we can be good people and we should be good people. Um, and and what do you do when the people in in charge and the people who have all of the power have absolutely no moral compass at all, and you have to fight even though you can't possibly win? And that that felt to me like a story that that I was happy to tell, that I wanted to tell, that I was angry enough to tell, and that that needs to be out right now. And that got me through the writing process. Because I think if I was just writing some Arthurian legends, you're right, it would be like, well, here's a giant, and here's like a quest for a stone, and here's a magic screaming rock. And it would all be very arbitrary and very random. And I think the reason that the game, sorry, I've gone all serious, but the, the no, reason fine, that yeah. the game hangs together thematically is because underneath all that Arthurian stuff and the thwacking and the board game and all of that is this consistent, angry, passionate, moral core. And that's something that as a writer, I, I believe that we should always have. And I think games often don't bother to have. Um, because they're scared of being political or they're, they're worried that they're going to tell people what to think, which is absolutely not the point. It's not about telling people what to think. It's about getting people to feel something consistently and be involved with that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was so important to me um, that that really tied it together. So for me, it's because Arthur is actually such a deep symbol in the British psyche and, and also in the American, I think, by extension, mm -hmm. of like of what... Our leaders are supposed to be like what government is supposed to be like what the country is supposed to be like we're supposed to live in a world of round tables and nights and we like to believe that we do but we often don't mm -hmm. and i think that yeah that really was the motor behind behind the storytelling for me and i, I yeah and i hope some of that comes across to people i really do because i think it's terribly important i think it comes across in this one run we did um oh. like as you watch the whole arc of it um Tom, uh, I keep just going. I keep throwing out a question. John answers, then they go, Tom, do you want to weigh in? But uh, that's all I can do. Um, Tom, do you want to weigh in and on your thoughts about turning your beautiful board chess solve chess game into something Arthurian and messy? No, everything he said, the theme fit really well. I think we all realized that. We tried some other themes a little bit, like ages and ages ago, we were thinking how it could be a court case and it was two lawyers fighting. I don't even know how that was supposed to work. <laughs> um, and there's, like, we flip-flopped on a lot of things, um, like, really early on before we started really developing it full-time. But I think this was something we were really consistent on. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's one neat... Oh, I think we're actually about to come across it. Um, there's one neat feature in this game, which is the Tales game. I completely forgot to mention this at the top, but uh, we low-key have to uh, do some disclosure. Um, this is a GDC Twitch stream, but we also, you know, this is also tied to Gama Sutra. And Gama Sutra editor Chris Kerr is one of the people who submitted a story for your uh, campfire uh, feature, where the characters hang yeah, out and talk around the yeah. fire. Uh, Chris Kerr is a great writer, and I'm so glad that he got something in. Um, the one we'll see in the stream is actually really fun. Um, but I'm, uh, we'll see it. I guess it's not this encounter, but maybe the next one. But what, uh, what were your thoughts on that and roping good writers in to write little tales for you i'm just well that's a neat story what was all that about i am so happy we did that and that was a complete stroke of luck really so um we had this mechanic of people sitting around the campfire in the game for a while and it was really just a way of gaining an extra health point and they would sort of run some conversation between their characters and i felt like they didn't have quite enough to talk about and obviously at a campfire, what you do is you tell a story. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe sometimes they could tell a story. And I wrote a story and I thought, oh, I'll write some more of those later. I, just, I don't feel inspired right now. And then lockdown happened, coronavirus, COVID lockdown happened. And, um, and there was kind of this mood in the air of lots of people stuck at home and not quite knowing what they were doing. And it kind of, I thought what, what I really, what we really want to do, I had this sudden urge to, try and make some space for some people to do something nice and do something like fun and interesting and take their minds off this thing and we didn't have an enormous budget for this game I, I couldn't hire extra writers and anyway no one would have been able to understand the way the game was written internally because it's such a mess <laughs> like, like you know there was no way to hire co-writers for the game but here was this this one aspect these campfire tales which was not only 
not only perfect for packaging up and giving to people who had no idea how the rest of the game worked and didn't need to know, but also would really benefit from getting, you know, different voices. Um, so I pitched it to Joe, the Joe Humphrey, the co-founder of Inkle, and said, you know, can we spend a bit of money and get some writers? And, and he said, well, we can try, but like, do you think they're going to be any good? And we sort of thought, well, we really have no idea. We just, we just have to try. And I remember we, we put the call out for writers and it, it was quite widely promoted actually, which was really nice. I felt it captured the mood of the moment quite well, just this sense of people, uh, look, here's a nice thing to do. Do it if you can, if you feel like it. And I remember the very first story that we got sent back was uh, from one of, it's in the game and it's called The Man Who <gasps> Couldn't Fart. And the note that came with it said, um, despite the title this is a serious story i hope you enjoy it and i thought oh god here we go you know this is this is what i've let myself in for and i read the man who couldn't fart and i was i i'll be honest i was blown away it's an amazingly good story it's got a really quality moral it's geniusely delivered and i just thought oh wow this is gonna work this is actually gonna work and over the next I think it was two, maybe three weeks of submission period. We got something like 500 entries. So I was just constantly reading these tales. My family would come downstairs in the morning and I'd be sitting there on my laptop going, I've read another 15 of these things. And like just churning through and churning through. And here we go. Here's uh, the... the kind of average is worked out, if you might. Oh, which one is it? Um, uh, uh, the story of failure. The lonely uh, night of... A knight who fails at his quest. Oh, it's... Um, a... Baldwin and the Chalice, yes, yeah, um, and yeah, the, the, the average is kind of worked out you like might you, you might expect maybe ten percent of the stories were were not great, um, and then ten percent of them were absolute astonishing, and then there was a middle ground where we had to find the ones for our game and our characters and our universe. But it was a really enjoyable process and kind of bringing those together. I was just delighted, actually. I was delighted with how it went. Mm -hmm. um, and they still just make me so happy when I find them in the game. And I feel like they're, they're kind of the heart and soul of the game, is this idea of voices and stories and stories mattering. And ah, uh, yeah, I love all of that stuff. I really do. I love this little story. Um, we started a little late. I think I'm still going to cruise us in for a, I'm going to cruise us in for a landing soon. Um, uh, you know, best, best, best to get out while you're still welcome is one of my philosophies in life. Maybe, maybe that's why uh, I'm not a rich man, but I don't know. Wow, that got really too weird and deep. Okay, that's what, COVID, let me tell you, as an interviewer, <laughs> COVID has made interviewing so weird because you're trying to have a conversation acting like everything's normal. And then midway through, you just sort of like have to admit it's not. And I'm so thankful that you two have discussed that COVID and locking down has influenced your product work as designers because it saved me sort of just asking the generic question, how are you doing? How's your lockdown going? And in the UK, you have a totally different lockdown mm. situation over here. Like, apparently, I hear it's uh, legal to drive halfway across the country uh, to test your eyesight um, uh, over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they keep changing their minds about whether that's legal or not, but I think it basically boils down on it depends on who your father is. Yes. Oh, boy. Oh, that's this country, too. Oh, no. Anyway, uh, so if you have questions for John and Tom, let's get them in. Um, I guess... Uh, Oh, man, do I have any questions left? I think I do. Hopefully chat is willing to throw in something intelligent uh, because I try to be an intelligent person. But like I said, this is the mask. Like the mask of professionalism slips more often when you're when you're just like, oh, shit, this interview wraps up and I have to go sit in my apartment some more. And then I, my day wraps up and I sit in my apartment playing video games like Pendragon. Um, I guess... Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. I have one. I, I it's shown up in the stream already, so we're we're past it. Uh, there's a line that repeats, which is where um, Guinevere says this this plot of, this field reminds me of where Arthur b chose to build Camelot, and it it fires twice in this playthrough. And on the second one, Guinevere talks about something different that followed the first one. And I feel like this is a huge challenge for procedural narrative. It's why sometimes, like, I start off procedural narrative games and then I bounce as a, a point where I'm like, okay, I'm running through some of the same basic beats before, and it doesn't feel or it feels stiff. It feels like a machine is spitting words out at me. Um, and I think it's for better and for worse that good games and bad games I've played have encountered this. Uh, I love Blazeball, but this sort of might be why I'm I, I bounced off Blazeball when I tried it. I don't know if you two know what Blazeball is, but I don't either, so that's okay. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, what do you think, like, you know, for a company that keeps doing procedural narrative, 
what do you think is sort of the the sauce behind making sure that your computer, which is taking inputs and spitting outputs, um, you know, ones that you've carefully strung together, but still, um, you know, what's, how do you make sure that stories feel like stories and not inputs and outputs, I guess? Like, that's my last question for the both of you. Um, yeah, that's quite a big question. <laughs> so I think repetition is a particularly bad thing because we're so good at noticing it as mm -hmm. people um and dragon actually contains a whole bunch of systems to prevent repetition from one game to the next game like actually it, it remembers quite a lot of what you it remembers everything you see during the game mm -hmm. um that's just what the ink engine does but actually it remembers most of what you've seen during all your previous games as well to try and mix things up and try and find new routes through the content and avenues that you haven't seen before. There's a limit to how much of that we can do because like, we can't record every word, um, obviously. This is a game you might play 200 times. Um, but it's definitely something we've worked really, really hard to try and avoid. But a lot of it is actually a balancing problem. Like, You mm -hmm. need a decent amount of content and you need the content to be able to vary itself, which is something that the Ink Engine is very good at. So, you know, a single sentence can turn out different ways depending on who's saying it and mm -hmm. how they're feeling and just random numbers as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also it's, it's about kind of what we try to do is we try to lay down a bedrock of things that the game can say which are very, very self-varying but will work and then to pick out as much specific context as we can so the way that the system works i think i wrote a gama sutra article about this actually but the way the system works is that it looks for very specific matches for the current context and then drops back to generic ones that can't find any so if you have a move where it's guinevere and she is attacking a creature and the creature has just attacked one of her own pieces there might be a specific line of dialogue for that exact context mm -hmm. which will fire under very random rare circumstances because it's so specific so that doesn't need much variation. But if it turns out that it can't find any of those and it will drop back something more generic, which is just you know the usual kind of Guinevere runs across the ground and, and wallops something with her sword, of which you will have seen the same line of content 50, 100 times, just tweaked and varied by the context. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's an enormous problem. And I think Pendragon is an attempt to tackle it much more than we ever have before, 80 days before does a little bit of this stuff in some places and Heaven's Vault does too but Pendragon pretty much is entirely built out of content which is actually repeating itself all the time but attempting to disguise that as much as possible and largely getting away with it I think but yeah Tom do you have any there are always going to be some repetitions along the way do you have any thoughts? Uh, I actually have a question for John on this one because John is the master of story <laughs> I just make like code things happen um, I'm curious to know whether it was easier to give the ink um, solid sort of pieces of state that you could work off with this game, which is obviously really state-based, or something that's more woolly and story-based, like Heaven's Vault or something, where you know there's no fixed positions of things. There's just you're in a world and there's stuff around you. Yeah, this was a lot easier. Um, like the, the bedrock of Heaven's Vault is the knowledge map, which is kind of all the things that Aaliyah can be thinking or realize during the course of the game. And mm -hmm. that is impossible to really write down. So the only way to make the dialogue work is to have that knowledge map entirely in your head while you're writing it. So at the time that was okay, but now when I look back at it, I have no idea what's going on anymore <laughs> in that script. And it's very Oh, John, I lost you. Uh, Tom, did you lose Game John? side thing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> John, we lost you there for a second. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Ah, uh, well, in Pet Dragon, anyway, there's a game side thing which Tom wrote, which works out what the current move looks like and assigns tags to it. And that's mm -hmm. a lovely piece of robust analytical code. It just looks at the board and looks at the squares and looks at the threats and... And then there's the ink side can just read off that completely. And that separation between the kind of game analysis and then the ink just running with it, that made it a lot easier to do, I think, that there was a clear, a really clear distinction. Whereas Heaven's Vault, everything is very muddied. Um, 
So yeah, not that I ever want to make a game like Pendragon again, because it was really very difficult, I thought. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think, Tom? Was it hard? Uh, it was hard in some ways and easy in others. I think maybe, oh, I don't know. I think because it's so much, um, I don't have a word for it, bucket of stuff approach, where it's just everything is contextual, or at least so much is, mm. it probably took it longer to come to life. I remember first showing it to Joe when he came down first showing it. Sort of showing him what we've been doing for a while um, and sort of having seen it in this state where like every time it would load a level it would just say something completely random and you showed it to Joe and like he had this perfectly normal playthrough and just everything just worked out and like after just piling stuff into the bucket after like a few months all of a sudden oh no it can just sort of produce like really robust content and like yeah the more you pile away the better that system gets. Yeah, I do love the bucket of content approach, actually, for exactly that. That when you when you get to the point where it starts to produce halfway sensible outputs, then everything you do from there, every extra bit of content you add is just adding value somewhere. Like, and you don't know where it's going to come out or when it's going to come out. But when it does, it's always like really, it's a real pleasure to see it when it does. Like, oh, it's that joke. I remember that joke. Um, yeah, no, I, I have enjoyed that, actually. Right on. I think it's time to start wrapping up. I'll give a quick shout out to Chaotic94 in chat, who just says, love all the talks on YouTube. Keep up the good work. Uh, as, a, as a pitch for our friends at Inkle, there are some talks on the GTC YouTube channel from uh, from folks at Inkle about the making of games like Heaven's Vault, 80 Days, and so on. Um, one of my favorites, it's not Joe, Tom, or, or John here, but um, uh, Meg Giants uh, talk about the... Uh, NPCs in 80 days um, and how, how you can empower your NPCs to tell better stories in games. One of my favorite talks and one of my inspirations for some of the writing I've done uh, outside of, outside of you know, I, I love it. I love thinking about game worlds in terms of the, of the characters you meet in them. Um, so with that, uh, John and Tom, if they have more questions for you about Pendragon, where can they ask them? And also, where can they buy Pendragon? I might as well let you pitch the game. So Pendragon is available now with a 10% discount all week on uh, this weird little shop called Steam that you might have heard of and also on this lovely shop called GOG which you might also have heard of and also on the Mac App Store if you're unfortunate enough to ever use the Mac App Store. I'm joking, it's wonderful. Uh, and yeah, you can get it there. And if you want to talk to us, we're at Inkle Studios on Twitter. Right on. We also have a Discord channel, but you can find that from Twitter, probably. Also, it's in the game. You can access... I thought this was really smart. You can yeah, hit escape and you can click join Discord, which I think more devs are doing. Oh, well, there you go. So you need to buy the game so yeah. you can join our Discord so you can ask about the game. That there makes you perfect go. sense. <laughs> there you go. Okay, with that, uh, before everyone on my team gets horrifically murdered, I'm going to end this looking like I'm a smart, strategic person and bid you all adieu. We're actually, uh, for fans of GDC... It's going to be an interesting week for us. Tomorrow we have a stream with uh, the CEO of Proletariat. They make Spellbreak. Um, uh, later this week we've got some cool things coming down the pipe about what is happening. Next GDC is going to be next year? Question mark? We've announced July things, but I don't... It's all weird. It's... it's. I mean, we're no, that's announced. That's confirmed, to be clear. But also, like, we're still figuring out how to make GDC happen in, in these uncertain times. Um... Uh, so we're doing we're doing that. We're trying to bring more lessons for you. We're bringing more great interviews with developers. Um, we're excited to keep. Uh, we're excited that as the world enters a weird space, people want to keep making games, and we want to keep talking to them about making games and learning what they've learned, et cetera, et cetera. That's always going to be. Uh, uh, it's so thrilling to see that that like holds up even when everything gets weird. Um, and I'm just grateful that John and Tom are willing to talk about like how a weird world influences. Uh, um, making and releasing games. It's going to be a weird, like, man, you two are, it's going to be weird for all your colleagues in a year or so when they release their games and they're like, yeah, we finished this in lockdown. That influenced some stuff. Um, anyway, with that odd note, I will end this stream and wish everyone a good day. Thank you, Favlet, for hanging out. Thank you, Chaotic94, other folks, and have a good day. Bye. Bye.